Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming to the uh, seminar. So today we have a very, uh, we have an excellent uh, speaker, um, Dr. Shan Lo. He is a lecturer in robotics at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Liverpool. He leads the Advanced Robotics Laboratory Smart Lab at the department. Uh, his main research strengths are in visual tactile robots, robotics, including the development of robot visual tactile sensors, object recognition and localization using vision and touch, and multimodal perceptions. Uh, Dr. Lu um, received his PhD in robotics from King's College London in 2017, uh, 2016. He visited the MIT Computer, computer and uh, the Art, Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, CISEL, in 2016. After graduating from his PhD, he worked as a postdoc uh, researcher uh, at the University of Leeds and Harvard University, and he joined the University of Liverpool in 2018. Today, he is going to talk about uh, multimodal and cross-modal visual or uh, tactile perception for robot textures manipulation, manipulations. I really look forward to seeing, uh, hearing your work. Shan, it's all yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Hong Jin Yang, for your great introduction. And it's my honor to present my work um, at IR uh, Lab at uh, University of Birmingham. And today I will introduce our work on multimodal and cross-modal visual tactile perception for robots um, dexterous manipulation. Um, I can say we have a lot of overlaps um, in the research interest between our two labs um, and I uh, hope uh, we can foster some collaborations um, um, in, in, through this uh, talk. Okay, here is an overview of my talk. So firstly, I will introduce the motivations of our research. So uh, really we get inspired from human sensing and we apply these inspirations in robot sensing uh, and also in robotics tasks. Um, then I will introduce three main topics um, of our research. Uh, first one will be ob object perception using tactile images. Here you may ask why we have tactile images. So I will introduce what sensors we use and why we have the data as images for tactile sensing. And then I will introduce the visual tactile synergy for object perception. So how we combine vision and tactile sensing. So we have multimodal uh, sensation and also we have cross-modal sensation for object perception. And at the end, I will introduce how to simulate um, high resolution tactile sensors is a very hot topic in same to real learning in robotics. And we have contributed a simulation model for high resolution tactile sensors in simulation. So first of all, why shall we focus on um, tactile sensing? Um, why shall we make use of visual tactile sensing in robotics? So we get our inspirations from humans. So in our daily life, we make use of vision and tasks for many tasks. So for example, for especially for like uh, garment manipulation, uh, for folding and laundry tasks, we use our eyes and also the sense of task on our hands to manipulate these garments. So you can see on the left, when we do these uh, tasks, we not only use vision, but also we use our sense of touch on the hands. And also when we do uh, sewing, um, it's a very dedicated um, task. Um, otherwise we may get hurt from the sewing task. So we also use our eyes and also the sense of touch to guess the motions of our hands. And sometimes it's uh, even more important to know how one is sensing um, modality is important when it's lost. So here, um, there are some experiments on the psychological uh, researchers. So um, here, this woman uh, has got he, her hand uh, and then satis. So she has lost the sense of touch for her uh, fingers. And she is relying on, his, on her vision to let a match. So you can see it's very challenging for her to rely on vision to do the task. So it means um, 
Even for one very simple manipulation task, we need to combine vision and tactile sensing. And inspired by this, we um, should make use of vision and tactile sensing for robotics to enable robots to have tactile sensing along with vision. As you know, vision has been uh, very much investigated. We have a lot of uh, great uh, sensors, these cameras. But for tactile sensing, it's uh, still challenging to get a good candidate for um, getting the information from the fingers. In the past years, so we have got a lot of candidates, uh, tactile sensors based on different sensing principles. So we have seen capacitive ones, uh, piezo electric, um, um, piezo uh, resistive, optical, and many other sensing principles. Um, here I listed some um, widely used the commercial ones, like wise tactile sensors, biotech sensors. Um, most of them, they have been based on capacitive sensing principles. But one main um, uh, this, uh, drawback of such commercial uh, sensors based on capacitive sensing is the resolution of the sensor. So for example, for human finger, for one finger pad, so we have around 14 by 14 miracle receptors to sense as a contact with the objects. But for like for Biotech, for WES, it has much less a resolution. For example, for WES, it only has um, 14 by six uh, sensing elements on a much larger uh, area. Um, so we have peers uh, in proposing new sensing principles. For example, we can use optical fibers to get the contact information. Here you can see we have several optical fibers and we can sense the deformation of the tips. Um, by observing these uh, um, deformations of the tips through the optical fiber, uh, so we can guess the different light intensity and we can predict the false um, information on the tape of the false of, of the tactile sensor. So here you can see so we can increase um, this resolution of the sensor, but it's not large enough. So recently we have make we have made use of uh, cameras to capture uh, this uh, uh, tactile information. Here is an introduction to the gel tape sensor we have introduced recently. So we call it gel tape sensor. So this is the very first uh, all around finger tactile sensing uh, for robotic past. Here we um, get inspired by human finger. So for human finger, we not only have uh, the information inside our grasp, but also outside the grasp. So that's how we call it all around finger tactile sensing. So we mimic the shape of the human fingers. So we have uh, this shape as a column with a semi uh, sphere on the top. And we cover uh, this shape with the silicon, a soft silicon on the top. Here you can see we have a silicon layer and on the outside um, layer of the silicon, we have a reflective surface so that it can reflect the light into this space. So when one object is in contact with the sensor, the camera as the base can capture the deformation of the silicon. So that's why we call it camera-based tactile sensor. And uh, um, as a result, the data we get from the sensor is a, tactile, is, a, is a tactile image. So that's how we call it tactile image, as we are using a camera. And the data we have is an image. So it has three layers. So the tactile tube and the clear uh, silicon membrane, and we have one reflective paint cause. And this is the prototype we have got. And we have attached this sensor to the robotic grippers. And here you can see when, ha when we have one strawberry um, in the grippers, so we can sense the texture of the strawberry through uh, the tactile sensors. And here we have a short demo on how we use our tactile sensors to detect the contacts. So here you can see we are moving these robotic grippers 
um, at different poses. And uh, you can say we can detect the contacts through the tactile images um, at different poses. So that's how we get all around sensing. This can be very useful when we have a cluttered environment. So for example, here, if we want to move these blocks from this grid world, so we can um, use our tactile sensor to detect the collision against all of these objects, and we can better plan the motions of the robots. So now we have got the sensor, we have got the data. So how can we extract information from the tactile images we have received from the tactile sensors? So this comes to uh, object perception using tactile images. So for um, object perception, we can, um, through tasks, we have haptic sensation, or we call it active task. Um, so it can be divided into two parts. The first part is tactile sensation. So we get the pressure distributions uh, as the finger pads, and so we, can, we, uh, we can call it a passive task. We can guess the pressure, vibration, and textures. So when we get in contact with the objects, but also um, as humans, we always move our fingers, our hands. So we have also we also have a kinesthetic sensation involved in this active touch sensing, or we call it a proprioceptive sensation. So we know where our look our uh, the, the locations of our body parts in the three D world. So in the preverb works, um, there are two types we can use like a tactile um, point clause, we collect the contacts uh, with the objects and we assemble it into this uh, 3D model and we can recognize these objects. Or we can assemble all of these contact images and we put them in one map. And then we can know uh, the appearance of these objects uh, by our currency grid mapping. Um, for this method, we can uh, recognize arbitrary contact shapes, um, but it can be time consuming. We're investigating a large object surface. On the other side, there are other works using this uh, bag of words method, these traditional um, variant techniques. Um, this bag of words, we can um, put all of these uh, features into a bag and then we can recognize these objects. So here you can see. Um, when we have these uh, tactile images, we can extract these uh, uh, features, these tactile features from tactile data. We can have image moments by extracting these uh, moments from these tactile images, or we can have these uh, uh, descriptors like uh, uh, saved or other de descriptors to describe these tactile images. And then we put them together and we can use a histogram to represent the frequencies of these descriptors in these objects. And then we can recognize these objects. So um, by using this method, we can uh, review, we can uh, review local features, but on the other side, we lose the 3D information. Okay, so is that possible to combine them together to have both local texture information and also the moment information of the, um, the texture sensor. Um, we can make it by creating a high dimensional point clause. So I have proposed a method called iClap, uh, interactive closest uh, local, uh, these uh, um, uh, labeled points. So for matching these high dimensional point clause, so for each object, at each data collection um, location. So we have tactile readings and also we have 3D sensor location. And then we can form a high dimensional point clause. So we have these uh, um, words from these uh, tactile patterns and we put these words as additional dimension to this point clause to the XYZ locations of the data collection points. And then we can match these high dimensional um, points by interactively uh, matching this, uh, uh, by minimizing this uh, uh, loss function, this error function. Um, in our experiments, we have showed by fusing 
these locations and, and local pattern information, we can uh, achieve a better perception of these shapes. We can achieve a higher accuracy in recognizing um, more than 30 objects. So in the um, previous slides, you have seen how to use these uh, um, handcrafted features. We have tactile safety features or image moments to attract the patterns from uh, uh, the repetitions from the tactile images. So now we have also a uh, uh, period, period in these uh, uh, deep learning approaches. So we have made use of uh, uh, attention mechanisms in learning the features from tactile data. So here you can see we uh, phase a sequence of tactile images into this CNN um, here. So first we learn these uh, spatial features from the each input and we apply this uh, spatial attention to learn, um, okay, which part is in contact with objects and uh, what features we can get for that specific location. And also we want to learn this temporal attention as we have this, uh, uh, this sequence, uh, we want to know uh, which part of the sequence we need to pay more attention and we can learn better repetitions of uh, these objects. And then we can predict um, these class, uh, classes of these objects. And by having this uh, attention mechanism, we have uh, um, improved the um, recognition performance in these uh, object recognition task. And also here we can integrate vision and tactile sensing. In the past few slides, we have seen uh, using tactile data to recognize these objects. Also, we can combine vision and tactile sensing to perceive the objects. On the left side, we have visual input, we have vision. So um, it's also related to human experience. So when we grasp one object, we usually use our eyes to have a glance of the object. So we have a visual map of the objects. So we can have this RGB input of, uh, uh, of, of these uh, objects. And also we have this tactile um, observations of these uh, objects when we plot this object. So we can create uh, these uh, links between vision and tactile sensing by matching the features in vision and tactile sensing. So here is a, a setup for localizing the contacts uh, in these objects by matching vision and tactile sensing. So here we have one tactile sensor, we have this uh, 3D printed gecko, um, and uh, at the first we have this uh, visual image and we take it as a visual um, map, and then we have this tactile sensor it closed um, the gecko model and we can localize the contact of, on the object by matching the features from vision and also the features from tactile sensing. So here is a framework we have for filtering the contact locations. So we have these motion updates and also we have these overall updates to match the features from vision and tactile sensing and then we can filter out uh, the contact locations. So for the motion model, uh, we use the uh, Gaussian distribution to model the, uh, the movements of the tactile sensor. As we get this motion, but we may not uh, arrive at this location for 100% uh, accuracy, but we have we model this uh, noise using a Gaussian distribution. Also, we match the features from this visual map and the features from the tactile um, uh, readings. So we extract the features from this visual map and also the features from tactile readings, and we match them so that uh, we have a sliding window to localize these contacts in this visual map. And here is a quick demo on how we um, localize these contacts in this, uh, um, on the surface of the Gecko model. And after contacting this uh, object for a few times, we can uh, localize these contacts here. 
So this can be useful for robotic manipulation tasks. So once we have this visual observation, um, we can we can explore the objects and then we can know where we are touching um, in the visual uh, images we have obtained before. So in the past few um, slides, we have talked how we use the data for perceiving these uh, um, object properties. And next, I will introduce how we can cross um, model this uh, tactile and uh, visual uh, perception. So we have this visual tactile scenery for object uh, perception. Here is one of the works I have done uh, at MIT. Um, so here we want to perceive the properties of uh, uh, fabrics, its garments. So here you can see we have collected a data set for garment uh, recognition. On the top, we used uh, the digital camera to capture images, video images and uh, pictures of these uh, textures of fabrics. And uh, in the second row, so you can see we use the tactile sensor to capture the, uh, the textures of uh, these fabrics. By comparing the first row and second row, you can see we have some common features um, of, tech, of uh, these fabric textures. So you can see we have these patterns in both camera images and gel setting data. And also here, so you can see this grid for this fabric, and you can, you can observe similar patterns in the gel set data as well. But on the other side, we have some noise in both modalities. So for vision, we have this color information. But for tactile data, we can't capture any um, this uh, color information of the fabrics. All the color is from the, uh, the sensor. So we have the different LEDs in, this, uh, uh, in the base of the sensor. So that's how we get these colors. You may have one kind of question, what are these black dots in this tactile data? So these are the markers we have put on the um, bottom side of the silicon. So when we have this uh, interaction with these fabrics, this more, these markers will also move with this silicon. So it will give us uh, more information of the spatial movement of the silicon. So that's how we have these black dots in this uh, tactile data. In this work, I have proposed uh, one method to um, combine visual features and tactile features to better recognize these uh, fabrics. So we have two pipelines for um, perceiving these features. We have visual data um, that is uh, fed into these uh, uh, convolutional neural networks, and also the gel set data that is also fed into the convolutional neural networks. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we have tactile images. So that's why we can use convolutional neural networks to, uh, to process the um, tactile data. And at the end, um, I have proposed this maximum uh, covariance analysis um, as a final layer to uh, maximize the, the uh, covariance between the visual features and the tactile features so that we can achieve a uh, latent space that it can learn better the severe features and also tactile features. One challenge uh, here is we have this weekly pairing uh, problem. So for many variant problems, uh, we already have exactly pairs for um, like different pictures. We have one instance, we can get this correspondence uh, images in uh, these instances in different images. But for this visual and tactile pairing, we have this weekly um, pairing problem as um, every time when we see this feature, this texture, we can't uh, feel it at the same time. If we are in contact with texture, we can't view this texture uh, at the same time. So that's why we call it this uh, weekly pairing problem. So video and tactile sensing, they are not happening at the same time. And uh, uh, we have to align these features 
um, together, but some of these textures may come from the same piece of the fabrics. How to pair them um, is a main problem we need to address. So here I propose these weakly paired sensing features. So I introduced these uh, metrics to um, weakly pair this vision and uh, tactile samples. And I um, propose this alternating maximum Mechanization to achieve this weekly uh, pairing mechanism for vision and tactile sensing. And here we have got this multimodal perception. We have we can maximize the perception for vision and tactile sensing. Um, but is it possible to have this cross-model uh, visual tactile perception? So uh, you can imagine in our daily life. Uh, we always have this uh, um, cross-model um, perception. So we have this uh, experience. So when we want to grasp something, so for example, we have one object here and we can imagine how it feels through our visual observation. So this is cross-model sensation, cross-model perception. Right? Um, in psychology, we call it um, synesthesia. So we have synergy between vision and tactile sensing. When we see something, we can imagine how it feels in our hands. When we get in contact with these objects, okay, we can confirm this uh, tactile sensation. So this is how we experience um, in our daily life. And here uh, we have applied in robotics. So we have this uh, visual inputs and we have this learned latent space so we can generate these uh, tactile audible, these pseudo tactile audibles. So it means when one robot um, wants to pick up uh, one object, it can imagine how it will feel in its hands, what tactile reading it can get when it gets in contact with the objects. And also similarly, or we can have the other way around. When we have one tactile input, we can generate one visual output. We can predict what kind of features we will observe in vision after touching it. Okay, so that's what we have proposed for cross model visual tactile perception. And uh, this can also be useful for e commerce, for online shopping. So, for example, here uh, for now, we usually use um, these uh, pictures to show these uh, clothes online. So, we want to buy. Uh, some clothes online, you check out these pictures, you can't feel them. But for dedicated uh, clothes, you want to feel, it. for example, like uh, underwear. So you want to know the feelings of uh, these uh, dedicated clothes, right? So if we get these pictures, we can generate these tactile out outputs, and then we use one tactile display to render these tactile feelings to the customers. So the customer can feel these uh, tactile um, like uh, um, properties of these clothes at home. So that can be one of the applications as well. And here is what we have um, um, tested. So we have this video to tactile, we have this video inputs, and we can generate these uh, um, tactile outputs and compare to the real image so you can see we can maintain these uh, textures in the tactile outputs, um, but also we can get these uh, um, black dots in the, in the sensor readings. Also, we have this tactile to video um, transformation. So we have these uh, tactile inputs and we can generate these uh, video outputs. But also, we, uh, these measures didn't work well for some cases. So for example, if we have this color information in the clothes, so they, the generated um, tactile outputs will be not as uh, not similar to the real image. And also here, the other way around, if we have this tactile inputs, if the clothes has um, this color information in vision, uh, we can't generate the realistic uh, these outputs. Um, but this is the very first work uh, for cross-model uh, visual tactile perception, and we are extending this work um, by encoding 
more uh, information in this generation process. So uh, we would like to encode attributes uh, like word embeddings in this process. We can describe these uh, um, clauses using words, and then we can inject these word embeddings into this learning process. We hope we can better uh, generate uh, these realistic outputs. And uh, in the previous uh, works, we have used tactile sensors and we have used tactile sensor to do robotic tasks. So next, I will introduce um, our recent work in simulating uh, the tactile sensors that we have seen. So we have seen this gel tape sensor, we have seen the gel size sensor, the original uh, gel size sensor proposed at MIT. And uh, you can see all of these camera-based uh, tactile sensors we have this uh, soft elastomer on the top, and we have a camera at the bottom. So well, we use the cameras to capture the deformation of the sequence. But one problem for using tactile sensors is um, that the soft elastomer can easily be worn out. So it's very delicate, and uh, uh, we have to replace this silicon after using it for a while. So one solution is we use thing to real learning. So we train the robots in simulations. We don't have to test our models um, in the real um, setup before it's uh, mature, right? So we first train our models in simulation and then we transfer our models to the real life so that we can save some tactile sensors, okay? And uh, same, real, same to real learning is a uh, very active, uh, active topic in robotics. So there are a lot of works in recent years um, to train the robots in simulation and then transfer to the real uh, environment. But most of the works have been limited to uh, visual inputs. So we can guess these visual observations of the sense. There has been no simulation models for tactile sensors. So we can't achieve this contact-rich manipulations in simulation and transfer them to the real life. So here we propose one um, model to simulate the camera-based tactile sensor. Um, this is the very first work to simulate uh, this uh, tactile-based, uh, this camera-based tactile sensor. So we divide the process into a few steps. So we use a depth map um, as the start. So um, the depth sensors are widely available in these uh, simulators. So we use this uh, depth map from these uh, depth sensors. Um, so we, uh, we leave this uh, uh, tactile sensor open. Um, and then we can get the depth information of these objects. So you can see we have this indentation. But you may ask the question, so why don't we just uh, simulate the deformation of the silicon directly? So the main reason is it will be very computationally heavy if we simulate the deformation. So if we use like um, a method like finite element uh, analysis, we can uh, simulate this uh, deformation very accurately, but it will be very slow. So that's why we propose this simpler method. So here we get this depth map, and then we use this Gaussian filtering to smoothen the edges of the complex. And then we have these uh, um, discrete uh, derivatives as the uh, edges of the context. And then we can illuminate the space using the form model. So we can get the tactile image um, as the output. So here is a diagram on how we um, generate this uh, simulation image. So we have this real sensor, so we use the camera to capture the deformation of uh, the object sensor deformation um, here. And uh, in the simulation, we also have a sensor at the bottom, but we have a depth sensor instead. We get a depth map as the start, and we use our proposed methods to process this depth map to generate this uh, uh, HB tactile image. So you can see we can get this uh, uh, Last gradients of um, on this surface, 
you may ask the question, why do we have different colors in this image? The reason is we are placing four LEDs at the base. So red, um, blue, green, and white, so that we can get the gradients of these lights, so that we can better um, capture the deformation. So you can see from here, by having these uh, um, gradients, we, we can know this, we can know more about this 3D information of the uh, deformation. And we have set up this uh, um, simulation model in Gazebo. So on the left, we have the real setup. On the right, we have the simulation setup. And on the left, we have the real output. On the right, we have the simulation output. Here, are, uh, what do we have got uh, for the simulation outputs? So on the first row, we have this real um, uh, tactile image. And uh, we have compared different ones. So this is our original method. We used one single um, Gaussian. And uh, you can see uh, we can have this shape. And we can have these lab distributions. And we can, um, after applying this difference of Gaussians, we can have better these uh, edges um, to simulate these uh, uh, indentations. And also, we have used uh, our method for simulating different camera-based uh, tactile sensors, not only the gel side, but also some variants of the sensors. And also one interesting observation we have got is for the real images, you can see we have a lot of um, artifacts. So these objects were 3D printed by a 3D printer. Uh, due to these uh, artifacts, created by the 3D printer, you can see these textures created by these 3D printers. But for this simulation, we have perfect models and we don't have these artifacts. To mitigate this gap, um, so we proposed one method to generate some randomly, uh, some random textures. So to simulate the artifacts generated by the 3D printer. So for example, the texture here, where the scratch is here. So we can generate these uh, um, artificial, uh, these artifacts um, on the simulation data. So once we get the uh, simulation articles, we apply these textures to the articles so that we can get these artifacts, um, these uh, uh, scratches and other artifacts. And by applying these textures, we can augment this uh, um, same to real learning um, um, to a large extent. And here is a quick demo on how we use this uh, uh, simulation model to generate these tactile images. So now I have covered these tactile sensors, how we use tactile images, and how we simulate uh, the tactile sensors. Um, next, I will also introduce some other works that are um, maybe of import potential uh, interest to you. We have also worked on computer vision. Um, so that may be uh, closely related to some of your research. Here, I just briefly introduce what we have done um, as uh, these works have been under review. So um, as you know, we have this data imbalance problem in many data sets. For example, in this COCO data set, um, this uh, person class has overwhelmed uh, the data sets. So for example, for this image, we have three persons, but we have only have one scale instance in this image. On the right, you can see we have more than 13 percent of instances uh, um, person. And we have some classes, we call them like rare classes, they are much less frequent in the uh, COCO data set. And I, as a result, for most of the, for, uh, I would say for all of these uh, state of art method in object detection, we have observed a um, very large um, job for rare classes. They can do well for person detection, but they have done quite badly for uh, less frequent, frequency, uh, frequent uh, objects. So for example, like umbrella, um, like uh, cars, so they can detect these objects um, 
with a very bad um, performance. But in the real life, these rare classes can be important as well. So in the autonomous driving contest, person is important, but other objects can also be very important. So like a, a street dog and the other object on the streets, we also need to detect them very accurately. So, but the state of art measures fail to do so. To mitigate this impact, so we have to pull this inverse image frequency transformation for uh, imbalanced object detection. So here we have this, uh, uh, this data set, we can count the appearances of these classes. And then we can get this uh, image frequency. So how many times these classes have appeared in these uh, uh, images? And then we get this uh, inverse image frequency. We have this log, uh, uh, this uh, k divided by image frequency. K is the total number of these uh, uh, classes of of these images. And then we can represent the frequencies of these classes in the data sets. And we embed this uh, transformation um, in this final layer of the uh, classic classification logics. So when we get this logics, we apply this uh, uh, inverse image frequency so that the real classes will um, be listed, uh, lifted. And for the frequent uh, uh, classes, we will assign uh, lower weights to these uh, classes. And by doing this, we can um, augment the performance for these real classes. And in our experiments, so we have seen uh, our method can outperform all the uh, state of art object detection measures. And more importantly, we can improve uh, the performance of uh, object detection for real classes uh, largely. Also, we can have this vision guided tactile correlation. So we have um, used a crack detection as an example. So we have this uh, visual input, we can detect this uh, crack on the, um, on the road. And, but as visual, uh, vision may not be accurate to detect this uh, crack. So we can generate this touch point. So we can use tactile sensor to confirm the profile of the crack so that we can get a better profile of this crack. And so in this way, we can get a better um, profile of the crack and we can better reconstruct this crack. And we have been extending this work to uh, have this, visual guided, this vision guided tactile cooperation for grasping and manipulation as well. And it's uh, 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 ongoing work and we are going to submit this work to ACRA 2022. And to wrap up my talk, so you can see through all of my works, uh, we have been uh, working on a single task is to um, enable robots perceive the physical world and uh, to enable the robot to interact with the uh, world safely. And we have proposed the high resolution camera based tactile sensors, and we have made use of these sensors for um, object perception, and we have uh, proposed the method for multimodal and also cross-modal perception tasks. And we have proposed this uh, simulation of tactile sensors for same to real learning. And uh, we are working towards to the goal to have uh, real tactile dexterity for robotic perception and also manipulation. So that's all for my talk and uh, I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. I think it's exciting work. I mean, to see all the uh, very <laughs> impressive works. Um, Thank okay. you. Is there anyone who has question? Okay, Hector. Hector, and then Mohan. Hi. Um, Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, I had a quick question about uh, the the simulator you have for your 
for your job site images mm -hmm. and the way that you're dealing with the 3d printing artifacts or rather the the, the structure of the um individual lines i suppose um so the, what you my understanding of what you said is that you're applying random patterns on the simulation to rep replicate that and I understand that for the top layer of the 3D printer, unless you have the motor commands, you don't know how it's constructed that. But um, almost all 3D printers print in layers. Um, so when you have particular structures like spheres, you have concentric rings, which are always there in the same place. And it seems like you're simulating depth maps anyway. So um, you have this information available to construct those rings. Uh, rather than sort of generating random patterns. Do you think that that would significantly improve performance or is it more about um, removing arbitrary, learning to, to ignore arbitrary random noise? Because I guess you're not going to be using it on um, 3D printed objects in the real world. Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, yeah, uh, it is the case so for these 3D printers, when we print these objects, they, we will have a certain pattern as we have these layers. And then you can see here, if we have a similar surface on top, so we already have these layers. Yeah, so we will have these certain patterns. And currently we are just applying these uh, patterns, um, these randomly to the surface of the uh, simulation, simulation models. Um, and I believe, um, as you suggested, I think uh, if we just apply this pattern on the top, so it may improve uh, the performance as well. So, but as you can see here, for these ones, these patterns are different from these layers. So um, here we are just manually uh, generating these uh, patterns. Um, but recently we have been extending this work. So we are using um, generative models to learn the patterns the 3D printer can give to the, uh, these objects. So we can maintain these patterns in the generation of the simulation images. And we have made some progress in this, uh, in this uh, topic. And uh, I believe so this can further improve um, these simulation outputs. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you. Wuhan. Uh, thank you, uh, Hingen. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so you, you were talking, I believe, um, I don't know if I got the slide number right, where you were talking about this uh, vision and tactile sort of like nothing you know, since slide 24, 23, somewhere. Did I get the number right? Yeah, I think I got it right. Good. So, so how do you train the system? I mean, like, uh, um, uh, what are the sort of input outputs you provide to train such a system in the network? So sort of two-part question, but before I ask the second one, I wanted to ask the first one. Can you can you tell me what the samples are or is it even giving any input output samples or just uh, generating these outputs? Can you talk a bit about this, please? Yeah, so for here, we um, as the inputs, we have uh, the tactile uh, input uh, uh, and we generate these uh, uh, video output. And also at the same time, we have this real um, video image so in the discriminator, so we uh, we have a uh, uh, input to the discriminator to compare this generated image and the real image. So it know okay which direction it should learn um, to guess the real. Okay, uh, so in some sense, the feedback image. is the sort of difference between the discriminatory error between the sort of generated and the actual uh, visual image, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so what is the, I'm trying to understand the motivation behind here, right? Like for instance, if you take humans or other people, like another, um, uh, uh, how to say this, animals that are capable of doing this kind of uh, behavior. So uh, if, if you had say uh, uh, a raw sort of uh, just touch-based perception and say the person could not visually generate things, uh, one would not assume them to generate something that is visually what a sort of a normal vision would produce, right? So what is the intuition here behind matching these two in this way and saying the, is it just a computational exercise to see if uh, a pattern matching can work? Um, so uh, the motivation is twofold. So the first one is uh, in the robotics context. Um, if we want to grasp one object, so we can imagine 
how it will get in, uh, um, how, what kind of uh, tactile image we can get. So it's like before we get in contact, so we can kind of plan uh, the motions. So when we see this uh, uh, object, we will, we will know, okay, well, if we touch in this way, what kind of tactile image we can get. If we touch this way, what kind of tactile image we, we can get. So it's like uh, predictive models. So we can predict what kind of um, what kind of observation we can get, so that we can better plan the motions of the robot. But to train such a system, you would have already generated a large number of these images, right? So why not just, and why do I need this kind of structure here? To train such a system, you would have had to generate visual and tactile image pairs uh, for a large number of uh, views and other things anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sorry, I might be missing something obvious. Like, you know, why why run this through this kind of like, you know, equivalence when you already have, I mean, as wouldn't another kind of say uh, a probabilistic model like some of the other things you showed elsewhere or some kind of sort of like, you know, something that captures the relation between these, wouldn't that be sufficient? Why do you need this kind of uh, encoder decoder and this discriminatory network and uh, such a, I mean, has this been attempted some other way? I mean, like, why would I build such a system? Yeah. So in the other worlds, so you can say both modalities um, exist at the same time. So we have uh, access to both uh, these modalities. But for this one, we assume um, now we only have vision and we predict what kind of uh, tactile sensation we will get. So we want to predict the future sensation. And uh, uh, also, so from the human experience, so if we grasp one object, we see it and we imagine how it feels. So that's uh, one of the motivations we have here. Another one is by generating these uh, uh, pseudo images, so we can augment our data set. So as you know, it's challenging to collect the data uh, with um, tactile sensors. Okay, so but it's easy to collect the video images. So we can uh, collect a lot of video images and then we generate these uh, tactile uh, uh, images and then we can augment uh, these uh, tactile uh, data sets and we can get a better um, tactile perception. And in our experiments, we have shown that by including these generated tactile images, we can get a better uh, tactile uh, recognition performance. Okay, I, I will just ask one last, I'll stop so that somebody else can ask a question. So just one quick thing to sort of do this kind of stuff, you would have had to sample the uh, range of visual tactile stuff anyway, right? So what I'm trying to say is if there is a sort of space of options possible of visual and tactile combinations, uh, you would have had to sample that anyway. To generate these new images, you would have had to seen something similar like that to build this network in the first place, don't you? So sort of seems circular to me, something is missing. How do I generate new images if I'm not first seen some such combination in the first place to train this network? Um, so I can say again. So like if I have a certain visual image and I have the corresponding tactile image yeah. to generate a new tactile image, say to, um, to augment the tactile image data set, I should have first seen the corresponding visual image and some such similar tactile image in the first place and have trained the network, right? So yeah. I don't get this. If you've already seen the sample, why do you need to generate more? You already have them, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. So uh, the main reason why we have this uh, generation uh, method is to in increase the number of uh, uh, the minority uh, cessation, right? So as I mentioned, it's challenging to collect tactile data. So we want to generate this tactile data. So when we train the model, we have limited numbers, uh, number of uh, the tactile images. So um, our assumption is, so for when we have new objects, we don't have to collect these uh, new tactile images um, too many times. As we have this model, we have got this model, we can generate these tactile images. So, we so, just, so are you saying that it extrapolates to completely previously unseen samples? That seems kind of difficult. Okay, I'll leave this. Um, that seems difficult to understand, but uh, how it can potentially do that because it's a learned model, right? It must have seen something similar to generate a new tactile image for a given visual image, but if it's a completely unseen object, 
it could potentially be arbitrary. Yeah, 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 it can be, yeah. But you know, uh, for certain uh, category like fabrics, they have similar uh, like properties. Um, so that I can understand, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, if it is similar, yes, but you were saying previously unseen. I mean, it, it has to have seen something similar, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi, hi again. Um, sorry, I have a, I guess, a follow on question, um, which I think you, you probably already partly answered right at the very end of your, your last answer. Um, so that you've, the way you've described the, the two networks here, it, it's as if they're quite disconnected. Um, I was just wondering if you've, uh, if you were using and maybe you just didn't, didn't um, draw it or, or you've thought about star transfer GANs. Um, because that would be a quite interesting way of doing it because you have these, I guess, two domains with different sort of types of appearance, but then you have these, this common, I guess, shape, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, which is present in both of the types of imaging and star transfer GANs that you sort of disentangle in to an extent um, that with disc, uh, with sets of data that aren't, don't have to be paired. Um, so I guess, probably from what you said, the limitation is just the amount of data you have to begin with to train. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, anyone has any other question? If not, I have, I have one quick question. Um, John, it's very interesting work. Uh, I thought, I'm just curious about how you collect the ground truth. So, I mean, I guess you want to like, um, you want to simulate the, I mean, ultimate goal could be uh, simulating the human's tactile sensors, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, tactile sensor is very difficult to uh, collect the ground truth data, I guess. Um, then how, would, how do you get the ground truth mm -hmm. of the sensors? So you mean for the simulation world, yeah? Simulation work and in general, like uh, how do you uh, sensor is like well, um, well, well sense the uh, real tactiles? Yeah, so um, here um, we, we take the real um, gel tape image as the ground truth. And uh, we use the structural similarity this, uh, to compare the similarity between the generated uh, uh, image and the simulation image. So, so you're, you're, you're kind of, you know, shape information, like, you know, or like, you know, uh, of the surface, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think, I guess that's the only way we can do at the moment, yeah. Yeah, it's quite challenging to get the ground truth in tactile sense, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, any other question? If not, uh, let's thank to the speaker, Shan. Thank you very much, Shan. Thank you very much. It's my honor to be here. <laughs>